good morning, and uh, I'm just uh, excited to be able to share some information about um, the role of nutrition in preventing and managing sarcopenia. Um, I'd like to um, just start out to let you know that a lot of the, the approach that I'm taking is um, is really from my perspective as a clinical nutritionist and a researcher. But um, so some of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning is um, has already been uh, provided to you and previous speaker from a different perspective, more from a molecular, uh, cellular level. And I want to review some of that stuff and from the perspective of how we, we as veterinarians can look at nutrients uh, in the diet uh, or in supplementation to, um, to optimize optimize the mechanisms associated with sarcopenia. So, so I'm sure there'll be some overlap, and um, hopefully that will um, remember that when you learn something over and over again, it sticks with you, right? <laughs> OK. So uh, starting out with um, sarcopenia, we've had the um, definition before, but it's a progressive loss of muscle mass and, um, and function, and it's an aspect of aging. Um, it's, it is considered a musculoskeletal disease. Um, but we don't really connect sarcopenia with disease. That's really, when the two of them are combined, we really think of cachexia. Um, it commonly affects elderly and sedentary populations um, with comorbidities that might affect the musculoskeletal system or impair physical activity. Um, interestingly, the um, literature indicates that the rate of muscle protein synthesis actually decreases by around 44% um, in older, um, when people that are over 60 years of age, as compared to younger individuals. If we try and translate that back to, um, to dogs, for instance, um, if we think about um, converting dog years to people years, that kind of gives us about a, a time frame of about eight and a half years of age for a dog where we're seeing approximately a 40% decrease in their, um, in their muscle protein synthesis. And, um, and also, I think that's kind of interesting because that's, you know, a lot for a lot of breeds, that's where we're thinking about the senior pet, uh, thinking about maybe changing their diet um, based on their age. And again, sarcopenia, um, the diagnosis of it encompasses decreased levels of, um, of a number of traits, including muscle strength, muscle quantity or quality, as well as uh, physical performance. Um, the degeneration um, associated with muscle um, with sarcopenia, um, it's mentioned before, and you can all imagine this, that it impedes daily activities. Um, it induces, um, influences rather, um, the outcomes after surgery, uh, increases complications uh, in, ter in terms of major surgical procedures. They, it gives individuals an increased risk of falls and fractures and um, as indicated just previously, it has recently received an international classification of disease. And it's, um, it's overall generally attributable to natural aging. And as we can hopefully appreciate at this point in the morning, that it is multifactorial. And so if we take a look at this, um, this slide up here, you can see that if we try and take an overview of the different mechanisms of, of, of sarcopenia, we can see that there are some that certainly make sense to us. Um, inadequate nutrition, for instance, um, that might be fueled by anorexia or perhaps an underlying malabsorption, maldigestion issue. Uh, sedentary lifestyle. We think about that for people. We might not think about that so much for our pets, but depending on the pet caregiver's lifestyle themselves, the pets may be, as they get older, um, not interacting with them as much and not being, um, having them end up having a more sedentary lifestyle. Um, there are a number of other things as well that maybe until this morning you didn't really consider as, as, um, as mechanisms that would influence sarcopenia, but certainly inflammation is a big one, um, increasing catabolic cytokines. Hormonal changes, uh, increase in catabolic and a decrease in anabolic hormones. Um, there's also neurologic alterations that are, that are occurring. We see a loss of the alpha motor neurons um, and how that impacts um, peripheral nerve myelin sheath intervention as well as regeneration of motor neurons. 
And then also we can't forget that um, other mechanisms involve the loss of satellite cells, which are key for helping muscle regenerate, um, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, as well as changes or imbalances in our um, proteolytic um, uh, pathways. Uh, I want to now just kind of move through taking a little bit closer look at these mechanisms and kind of put them into perspective from the, um, from the nutritional um, intervention uh, side. So um, we know that there's progressive neurodegeneration that occurs with aging. And essentially, we have, um, there's an age decrease um, in motor neuron, alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord, which results in a loss of peripheral nerve fibers and a decrease in the number of neuromuscular junctions. The types of fibers that are predominantly affected in sarcopenia are the type 2 Meyer fibers, or the fast twitch muscles. And um, what happens essentially is that um, they atrophy, they get dysfunctional fibers, and it ultimately affects the qualities of, of motor behavior in our aging patients. And so essentially what happens with, is that we see a loss in um, a loss in um, the regeneration of, of muscle and, um, and with aging, and that essentially has an impact on muscle mass, power, and force. Um, I have this little um, picture of an inset of a, of a muscle here, and this muscle is from a, um, it's a sample of from a 30-day-old um, rat that was severely sarcopenic, and the, the, the reason I put it up here was just to give you an idea of um, these, these areas here where there's a black asterisk is normal muscle, and then um, it's interspersed with bundles of um, atrophied muscle where these white arrows are. So you can see that um, as, as the animal ages, we, they get an in, uh, a mixture of both normal and uh, um, atrophied muscle, and that eventually will um, influence their mass, their function, and their power and force ability. What we really can think of this is, if you, from a different perspective, is that we get a change in muscle scaffold um, alterations. And so um, the muscle is not able to um, have the structure that it, that it normally has. If we uh, continue to look at the mechanism of neurodegeneration, um, we see a diminished muscle remodeling capacity, in, and that seems to be a hallmark of aged muscle. This, um, this picture up here is indicating that um, there is um, decreased remodeling during the aging process, but it's just not age. It also has, is impacted in terms of the degree or um, the rate of that decrease in remodeling has to do with how active the, the individual is how, um, and um, whether or not they're um, doing exercise as well as, um, as their diet. And so this is kind of a, a pictorial of that. Um, I also, when we talk about neurodegeneration, I think that we also have to consider um, uh, the, um, the cellular aspects, and our previous speaker spoke um, at large about those from a little bit different perspective. This is just really an overview of looking at mTOR. We know that mTOR um, is the primary regulator of animal growth through um, by controlling both catabolic and anabolic signaling of skeletal muscle. And that, that, that control is actually influenced by a number of things, uh, including nutrients and nutrient-induced um, um, molecules such as insulin. And that when, um, when this um, signaling, if you will, control, controls signaling to mTOR is, is um, blunted, then we get what's called anabolic resistance. And, um, and that's a, another key player in, in terms of um, considering how to feed this animal um, from the perspective of helping maintain, preserve muscle mass. Um, I mentioned already that uh, in the previous slide that, that uh, some of the anabolic signaling uh, of mTOR to promote protein, muscle protein synthesis is through um, insulin and IGF, or insulin growth factor one. There are also some other um, influences in terms of anabolic signaling, and they would be um, 
amino acids as well as some mechanical stimulation. And from this perspective, I would say, you know, we could think of that as exercise. Um, at the same time, you know, when there's, um, there's going to be an opposite, equal and opposite kind of reaction here. And so there are negative, um, mTOR signaling is, can be influenced negatively by what we call muscle atrophy inducing signals. And those that we know about at this point are uh, myostatin as well as glucocorticoids. Um, they could also be influenced by alterations in our um, protein synthesis and degradation pathways as well as um, uh, alteration in uh, insulin growth factor and how that influences um, uh, muscle synthesis. So uh, in mentioning uh, uh, insulin growth factor, uh, I wanted to uh, share this study with you that is their hypothesis was that IGF-1 will maintain muscle mass, suppress muscle loss, and stimulate muscle regeneration. And um, so I just want to kind of go through this, this uh, little cartoon here first to give you a, an idea of why they decided to do this particular study. Um, what, they, what, they, what is important to, to understand is that um, satellite cell activation is a response to muscle injury. Along with the activation of satellite cells, we get a, what you call a um, mobilization of stem cells into the muscle. When those two are there together, um, they, are, they receive um, myogenic stimulation, and that myogenic stimulation essentially, through a number of, of processes or steps, essentially helps with muscle regeneration, okay? It's been shown in the literature, or at least suggested, that an isoform of IGF-1, called MIGF-1, actually um, um, enhances muscle regeneration when there's increased expression of that particular isoform. So these investigators um, generated a transgenic mouse um, in which the local isoform of, um, of MIG, muscle M I IGF-1, um, is driven by a, a promoter. And they, um, they saw that in older wild type mice that underwent characteristic muscle atrophy, but the expression of this um, transgene was protective against normal loss of muscle during uh, senescence. And so in essence, what they were doing here was just um, supporting the idea that uh, increased, um, that this specific isoform can actually enhance um, regeneration. Um, with its increased expression. I also mentioned insulin um, as an as a anabolic, anabolic stimulant for a muscle protein synthesis. And so I think it's good to take a little bit closer look at altered insulin resistance. And this particular study was um, looking at insulin resistance and sarcopenia, and they, um, uh, they shared that a muscle, skeletal muscle is responsible for the majority of the body's postprandial glucose disposal, and that's done via insulin stimulation. And muscle mass is an important determinant of glucose and energy homeostasis, and it's determined by this balance between protein breakdown and protein synthesis in the muscle tissue itself. And finally, it's important to keep in mind that peripheral glucose utilization is reduced as a part of insulin resistance that occurs with aging. And so this little picture on, on the bottom on this slide is just kind of showing that. Uh, the top muscle fiber uh, is from a, uh, the top of the picture is, is from younger animals. And you can see that, um, that um, when we have adequate insulin, it can, um, and, and, and glucose, it can increase glucose um, utilization and that, um, that is ultimately, along with the assistance of amino acids, can, um, can actually promote muscle protein synthesis. And then in the older, in the older muscle, we see a decrease in, um, or an increase in insulin resistance, I should put it that way, and that it ultimately decrease in, perhaps due to diet, a decrease in um, amino acid um, specific amino acids ma making their way into the muscle, and, um, and that ultimately, ultimately um, results in um, a decrease in motor muscle protein synthesis. 
And so um, essentially this is suggesting that resistance to the anabolic action of insulin has really been demonstrated between older and younger um, um, or normal uh, forms of muscle mass. I mentioned insulin resistance, and I can't really talk, uh, talk about mention insulin resistance without talking about its relationship with obesity and sarcopenia. And so um, essentially sarcopenic obesity is, um, is uh, inf infiltration of, um, with, with increased adipose cells, infiltration of, of um, fatty tissue into the muscle and how that uh, influences muscle protein synthesis or, or degradation, and ultimately skeletal muscle function. So um, in short, you can see that in aging adipose, in, in the aging um, muscle tissue, we see adipose, uh, in the person we see adipose inflammation, which gets dis redistributed, um, redistributes the fat to the viscera and the skeletal muscle, and that is essentially leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. And this whole relationship here is kind of the underlying uh, component or aspect of sarcopenic obesity. You can see that um, inflammation, although it's not listed on the very top here, is also a key player in, um, in sarcopenic obesity. And so because of that, I want to talk a little bit about um, inflammation in regards to um, sarcopenia. Um, we know that the aging process involves chronic low-grade inflammation, and that this um, chronic low-grade inflammation, inflammation contributes to muscle loss and muscle strength and functionality. It can affect both um, muscle protein breakdown again and synthesis through a variety of signaling pathways. And certainly you appreciate the signaling pathways. Um, we'll go over this and I'll just review them real quick in just a second here. But if you look at this picture, you can see that, um, that um, low grade inflammation can have, um, can have negative effects on muscle protein uh, breakdown or degradation if you follow the red, air, the red solid arrows. And that um, exercise as well as protein supplementation can have, um, can sort of overcome those, um, uh, help overcome some of that in regards to um, enhancing muscle protein um, synthesis. So I did mention that um, the, um, these proteolytic pathways, and I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Just to recap, there's the uh, ubiquitin proteasome pathway um, that actually degrades about 80 to 90% of the proteins in our bodies. And then there's calpanes that actually degrade the cytoskeletal and membrane proteins, the enzymes, and the transcription factors. And, um, and so when we get a reactive oxygen species accumulation associated with aging, that causes an upregulation of the calpanes via calcium release from the muscle or from the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and um, we also get um, oxidation of the MAPK dependent pathway. And so these things are going to lead to um, degradation. We also have um, the uh, autoph autophagy pathway, which um, our previous speaker talked about in, in, in grave detail. And then we have apoptosis, which we all know is a process of programmed cell death um, and that um, Muscle weight declines progressively with advancing age, and um, that kind of works back and forth between increased apoptotic D DNA fragmentation. And that, um, interestingly, our type two muscle fibers are the ones that are, um, are high, the most highly susceptible to apoptosis. So um, as we talk about, I mentioned my, my, um, mitochondrial dysfunction in this relationship of mechanisms of sarcopenia. And I just wanted to, especially in sarcopenic obesity, and I wanted to share this um, study with you as well as this pictorial. And this was a study that was very recent, a 20, 2022 study, where they looked at mitochondrial uncoupling and uh, how to attenuate sarcopenic obesity by enhancing, enhancing skeletal muscle on um, mitophagy and quality. And so what they did was they took 81 week old obese male rats 
And for 10 weeks, they fed them either a high-fat diet or a high-fat diet with something uh, BM, BAM15, which is actually a um, mitochondrial uncoupler. And the reason they did that is if you look at this, um, at this picture here, you can see that when we have obesity and inflammation, insulin sensitivity goes down, so we have increased insulin resistance. And that kind of uh, promotes, if you will, the release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria. And over time, that um, causes a, a, a apoptosis, if you will, of, of those mitochondria. And um, that results in protein degradation and ultimately a sarcopenic muscle. On the other hand, if we're able to maintain the integrity of those, um, of those mitochondria with the help of mitochondrial uncouplers, then we can decrease the um, cytochrome C release and ultimately decrease the apoptosis and, um, and decrease the, the number of misfolded proteins, which ultimately will then decrease protein degradation and improve the muscle quality um, and, and mass. And so that's just what they did. They, um, they, this um, mitochondrial uncoupler actually fed to these rats for 10 weeks, actually decreased body weight significantly it, in, in these obese rats. It increased their muscle mass as well as their strength. It decreased some of the inflammatory mediators associated with sarcopenic obesity, and it enhanced mitochondrial function. I, do like, I would like to mention, though, that not all mitochondrial uncouplers are, um, are associated um, with, with molecules such as this. Um, there are some natural ones, and those would be the cruciferous vegetables like um, broccoli, um, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, kale. Um, and so we can think about those from the perspective of how are we feeding, how are we feeding our pets, and what are the ingredients that we're using in those diets. And it's just an overview um, indicating that, um, that this whole relationship between inflammation um, and how the muscle gets infiltrated with fat, um, it's particularly in the obese patient, and how um, the inflammatory mediators will ultimately add fuel to the fire in regards to, um, regards to um, muscle, muscle atrophy and dysfunction. This combination um, actually is given a new name. It's called inflammaging. And so you may, may come across that in the literature. And this is kind of what it's related to. So um, that overview of, um, of uh, mechanisms hopefully will give you some thought as to how we can utilize nutrients in the diet to, um, to impact um, that balance, if you will, between protein synthesis and protein degradation that may be associated, that's associated with sarcopenia. And so I just want to spend the rest of the time looking at some specific nutrients. And, um, and so a lot of the focus will be on um, vitamin D deficiency, of course, nutrient inadequacy related to overall balanced diet and protein intake. And just a, a comment before I, I show you some of the studies is that the supplementation of amino acids and proteins, vitamin D and polyunsaturated fatty acids have ergogenic implica implications on the regulation of muscle mass in the elderly. And in general, supplementation of vitamin D or polyunsaturated fatty acids has showed some really interesting interactions with the modulation of inflammation and how that um, decrease in, in, um, in um, uh, low-grade inflammation can reduce muscle wasting in the aging patient. So I wanted to just start out with looking at um, human. There's a lot of human st studies associated with this. There are very, very few studies in cats and dogs. Um, there are some studies, of course, in rodent models. But I'm giving you some information on, on human studies where um, this is a summary of actually 19 different clinical trials uh, to study the effects of protein, amino acids, leucine, and specific, specifically vitamin D and the um, um, uh, HMB, which is a, <clears throat> we'll talk about that in just, in just a second. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Um, there was a number of, a large number of, of uh, human subjects, over 1,500. They ranged from 50 to 90 years of age, um, and they had a variety of sarcopenia, frail. Some of them were healthy, some of them were postmenopausal, some of them were obese, some were bedridden, et, et cetera. And the interventions were dairy, and this was actually with cheese, milk, or casein specifically, and that showed that in these aging um, population that it improved markers of sarcopenia, physical performance, um, as well as um, postprandial muscle protein synthesis, but it did not increase muscle mass. Another intervention was using essential amino acids, plus or minus um, having those essential amino acids be enriched in leucine. And they were looking at them, that supplementation of essential amino acids in a range from anywhere between 3 grams and 15 grams per day. Um, and overall, it did increase upper body strength and walking speed, um, lean muscle mass synthesis, um, and reduced body weight. And finally, uh, um, one more is that um, uh, they're using HMB, which is a metabolite of leucine. Um, with and without arginine and lysine uh, associated with it. And what they saw um, after two to four weeks is that this supplement, supplementation actually reduced muscle breakdown in um, the bedridden, tube-fed elderly patients. And when they were on the treatment for 12 weeks, it actually improved muscle functioning, um, strength, and fat-free um, fat mass. Um, and increased um, lean, lean muscle mass and muscle protein synthesis. And finally, there another intervention was with vitamin D, and it was um, a range of dosage, and they found significant increase in, um, in muscle strength, improved mass, and lower extremity function in the sarcopenic um, patients, and they saw that it actually preserved muscle mass. So these were all very interesting. Uh, they were done a, a, a little while ago, but if I kind of look at the, what they've done in terms of in, already been done in humans in terms of intervention and try and highlight those particular interventions when we think about animals, we'll start with protein and amino acids. And um, you would think that we know that there are certain amino acids that can stimulate or, or be stimulatory for mTOR in terms of mo, mo, muscle protein synthesis. Um, and does that really influence muscle wasting? And so a couple of questions is anabolic response to protein ingestion blunted in aging? Is, is higher protein what we really need? Um, and what forms of protein would be most beneficial to address sarcopenia? So um, the first question is anabolic response to protein ingestion blunted in aging. I just want to show you that um, this study was done with stable isotope tracers in um, in um, young versus elderly humans, and they were comparing muscle protein synthesis um, post-absorption versus postprandial. And what they saw was that uh, there was no really difference in MPS post-absorption, um, but there was a difference um, between the two groups um, when we think about it, when we look at it from the postprandial perspective. And so, um, so su suggesting or supporting the fact that anabolic response to protein ingestion ingestion is blunted with aging. So then is higher protein what we really need, or is it some aspect of the protein that is more important? So um, this is a, um, uh, and, and, the, and some of the responses to that kind of question are very var variable based on the study design, et cetera. But if we look at a variety of studies ranging from um, 2008 to 2015, we can see that um, they looked at a number of different levels of supplementation, if you will, and, um, and came up with basically a consensus that um, recommendations for elderly men and women um, would be um, 1 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, and, or equivalent to 25 to 30 grams of high protein per meal. How does that translate um, to dogs and cats? Well, actually, the protein levels that for um, before they were increased for humans were somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And so this increase to 1 and 1 1.2 is approximately a 25 to 40% increase from the healthy, healthy, um, healthy animals. So we can look at it perhaps from that perspective in terms of is higher protein beneficial? 
What forms of protein would be most beneficial? There are studies that are done on branched chain amino acids. Um, we know they're the major carriers of amino nitrogen between the viscera and, the, and they're most responsible for the direct stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. But when we look at the studies, we, we, can, uh, we can identify that it's not really just the supplementation with branched chain amino acids. It really is um, really kind of looking at the leucine itself in terms of um, within that cocktail of branched chain amino acids that seems to have the biggest influence on, um, on uh, signaling with mTOR. And so um, the, uh, one particular study was actually showing that um, when uh, showing that muscle protein synthesis was really significantly increased in these older subjects when they consumed um, uh, amino acid supplement that had um, at least 2.8 grams of leucine um, and that that if the amino, uh, branched chain amino, essential amino acid supplement contained less than 1.7 grams of leucine, that there was no, no effect. And so if we look at that, we can see that um, you, can, you can put that into numbers, and you can say, OK, this branched chain amino acid supplement that had, contained about 42% leucine was much more effective than a supplement that contained less than 25% leucine. Um, and, um, so the data suggest um, that leucine can be very beneficial. And um, <clears throat> this is a, a study that I also wanted to show you associated with supplementation of oral amino acid mixtures in, uh, in relation to sarcopenia in older, um, in older adults. There were 41 of them, um, and they had reduced lean muscle mass, and they were sarcopenic. It was broken into six study phases. Essentially, they were given eight grams of an essential amino acid um, as a treatment, or, the, or they were giving an isocaloric placebo. They did this, um, they're giving it twice a day for 16 months. And, um, and what they found was that when they were given the supplement, that they had uh, improvements in, um, in lean, uh, also in fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin, uh, decrease in insulin resistance, and tumor necrosis factor, and that they had a better. Um, ratio of IGF-1 to tumor necrosis factor alpha. I wanted to make, uh, I wanted to point out that this particular um, cocktail, if you will, of essential amino acids included all of these listed. And if I do the calculations, that's about, the leucine content of that was about 30, 33, 31%. And so again, it's close to the 42. It's definitely above, um, above 25%. And one more leucine study is looking at um, uh, uh, these elderly people who had um, stroke and what, what happened when they were supplemented with, um, with amino, leucine-enriched amino acids. And this supplement had 40% of the supplement as leucine, and they found that skeletal muscle was increased in the leucine group, but not in the control group um, over time. Another, I um, want to just look at uh, leucine metabolite. Um, uh, which is HMB, and um, we know that leucine directly activates a mammalian target of mTOR pathway and inhibits proteasome to prevent proteolysis. Um, but under normal conditions, we, there's about a 5% conversion of leucine to HMB. And so <clears throat> um, it's, it's kind of difficult. It's not really, um, it's, it's kind of impractical to try and give that much leucine. We need about 60 grams of leucine a day to get a dose of three grams of HMB. And so um, these studies were looking at um, <clears throat> HMB specifically and not trying to get it through leucine. And um, it did affect, um, demonstrated effects on protein synthesis and also indicated an age decline, age-related decline in HMB. And so um, even though I'm showing you this information, the, the efficacy of HMB in counteracting sar sarcopenia is still, is still pretty much inconsistent, but certainly something to look at in the future. Um, and this is just, um, again, looking at some studies where um, they were given a um, HMB cocktail and, um, in sarcopenic uh, patient, older patients, and this was part of a systemic um, review, and there were three different studies involved. And overall, they were seeing that when they got the HMB, 
that they had um, that improved lean muscle body mass and um, it, um, in, in, in all these different situations um, of where these patients were. What about um, HMB and the canine? Well, there is a white paper um, from Metabolic Technologies from 2020. They looked at racing greyhounds, one gram per day uh, for 12 weeks, and they showed that they were able to decrease the, um, the, the greyhounds race 0.66 seconds faster than when they weren't given the supplement, and they also looked at at sled dogs, and they were given one gram per day for two weeks prior to and during their Iditarod competition, and found that when they got when they received the supplementation, that there was a measurable decreases in serum uh, creatinine ph phosphokinase and lactate dehydrogenase. And so, it seems like there had been some some benefit from this in um, in uh, in dogs, particularly working dogs. Vitamin D was mentioned earlier, um, and we know that, uh, that deficiency, um, there's a risk of deficiency and dysre dysregulated function um, with age, and we're really looking at low serum um, um, vitamin D levels. And um, again, it's partially explained by the alteration in type two fast twitch muscles. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly, sarcopenia does show a similar morphological muscle um, changes as vitamin D deficiency. And there's a number of mechanisms that have been proposed. If we just look at um, some studies, this one looks at uh, look, looking at the vitamin D receptor and showing that um, vitamin D deficiency or low serum vitamin D3 increase the risk of sarcopenia and that, um, and that the dis Vitamin D deficiency um, actually increased with age, and it talked about um, reducing sensitivity to D3 due to a decrease in that vitamin D receptor. Um, this is uh, kind of looking at vitamin D from the perspective of um, uh, metabolic basis, and um, when there was a deficiency, we can see that um, we get an increased protein breakdown. And so increase in pro, pro, proteolysis, we, um, it's associated, D3 deficiency associated with increase in adiposity, and also it's associated with um, uh, increased in um, uh, proteus activation that impairs muscle contraction uh, in relation to um, the senescent markers associated with aging. And finally, um, it, imp it has an impact on um, mitochondrial function, and we've already talked about that um, previously. So I wanted to mention polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, they have been mentioned uh, by um, earlier speakers, and this is just looking at the role of them on muscle mass and aging. Um, again, they looked at older women with their, that were exercising, and they were giving uh, fish oil for three months and saw some positive impacts from that. Um, also, they looked at older untrained adults um, supplementing for six months, and they saw increase in muscle mass and strength, as well as older adults. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, depending on the dosage, older adults that were only giving 1.3 grams of fish oil um, derived polyunsaturated fatty acids for 12 weeks saw no benefit. Was that the dosage or was that the duration? It's unknown. And then back again, um, giving a higher dose again, uh, in increased uh, muscle mass as well as protein synthesis. I wanted to bring up the idea of probiotics. Um, our first speaker of the morning, Jan, uh, was talking about, um, about the microbiota in the gut. And so um, I wanted to, there's some, some more recent work in the, in the human nutrition arena that's looking at the idea of an unbalanced gut microbial pop community or population, and that's involved in the pathogenesis of age-associated sarcopenia. And it's, it seems to be doing this by inducing and maybe supporting that concept of inflammation that I spoke about earlier. Um, the, um, Certainly, you saw from earlier, um, earlier data as well as, as um, a, a pictures that gut dysbiosis affects metabolic signaling of nutrients, increased systemic inflammation, um, increases in insulin 
uh, resistance as well as it changes neuron activity. And so, um, and um, I think it was Jan that uh, indicated um, what dysbiosis produces and that that um, increased production of this influences or exasperates sarcopenia. And um, again, at the, to kind of summarize that, you can say that uh, the idea now is that the gut muscle brain axis, and we know that we've heard about the gut brain axis, but this is inter, um, interspersing muscle in there as well. Um, when we have dysbiosis, we get intestinal permea increased intestinal permeability, um, secretion of endotoxin and LPS into the circulation. That ultimately is going to influence the neuron activity um, and induce local inflammation and insulin resistance and ultimately order, alter skeletal muscle metabolism. It has an impact on sarcopenia. And so um, there's a study that was done looking at um, looking at trying to understand gut microbiota, and um, it was a systemic review, and there were 26 preclinical and 10 clinical studies, and they were looking at um, um, seven probiotics, two prebiotics, and some short-chain fatty acids, and um, what they saw was that, um, that they were altering the gut microbiota through bacterial depletion, uh, fecal transplantation, and various supplements showed um, a direct impact on uh, or influence on muscle phenotypes. The ones that seemed to have, uh, have the most impact were the lactobacillus and the bifidiobacterium strains. Um, and then I also have a list here of others that were included um, in these preclinical trials that also seem to have in the blue a positive impact and the ones in the red a negative impact. And this is just the mechanism um, that we're looking at from, a, um, from changes in gut microbiota and dysbiosis and, and how that influences, th mainly through inflammation, um, muscle protein synthesis and, um, and breakdown in regards to sarcopenia. So uh, I just want to finish up with um, talking about a few nutritional strategies. And based on information that I shared, you know, certainly we might think about protein supplementation. Do we increase the protein in these animals in our pets' diets when they're getting older? Or do we just supplement with some specific amino acids? And while we're giving them what we consider the normal level of protein, an adequate level of protein for the senior, um, do, we use, um, do we use metabolites with like HMB uh, instead of the actual amino acid? I think these are areas of, um, you know, we still don't know the answer to. Um, vitamin D, would, should we be supplementing with more vitamin D3? Certainly supplementation or over uh, excessive vitamin D3 can, has been shown to be detrimental in, in many animals for certain things. Um, and I think the literature is indicating that maybe we don't need to necessarily supplement it, but we need to check to see if there's a vitamin D deficiency and try and bring that back up to speed. Um, and omega-3 fatty acids, uh, certainly can help um, influence and decrease the inflammation. That's part of the inflammaging aspect that that's, plays a big role in, in sarcopenia, particularly sarcopenic obesity. Antioxidants, um, probiotics I mentioned. Um, Dave was up here earlier, talked about uh, uh, a long, ongoing long-term study that Purina had done with um, cats and they were, um, showed that they were able to maintain their, their muscle mass, their lean muscle mass, and um, as one of the parameters longer when they were given a diet that was increased in protein, but also a diet that had specific amino acid supplementation in it, um, as well as a probiotic, which, per, um, a prebiotic rather, which was, um, I, can't think of it. Uh, I can't think of it right now, but um, a prebiotic that perhaps was helping to support a more healthy um, intestinal microbiota population. I think it's important that we focus on ideal body weight and condition, particularly when we're talking about trying to intervene or trying to prevent sarcopenic obesity. And I think that's something perhaps that we need to think about early on and not wait till the animal's a senior to have to intervene at that point in time, because I'm not sure how helpful that is once they're very obese and focus on nutritionally complete and balanced diets. Um, and here, I mentioned a couple of like uh, natural oncouplers of mitochondria. And, um, and so 
there are a variety of different vegetables that, and possibly grains that um, might influence mitochondrial function and ultima ultimately um, proteins, muscle protein synthesis versus degradation. And from here, from this perspective, maybe you could, it could take you, you might think about, so do I look at that from the perspective of commercial diets or do I look at that from the perspective of these new, these more common or increasing of interest, diets of interest like our fresh food diets or our homemade diets? Can we have an impact on muscle protein synthesis and sarcopenia based on the type of diet that we're feeding? Um, and then perhaps even the lysine enriched foods that um, not just the amino acid itself, but if we go back to the functional food perspective, how about salmon, chickpeas, brown rice, eggs, soybean, and there are a few others that are, in, that are leucine enriched foods. Um, this is just indicating that um, you know, we can think about that from the perspective of basically the healthy sarcopenic patient, but we have to remember when we're talking about nutrition that um, some of these patients also have um, underlying other comorbidities, and that might throw them into the cachexia category, but um, perhaps not, you know, it's early on and we can intervene earlier, so um, something to keep in mind. I've given a, a, a table here of um, look, looking at suggested nutrient levels for the sarcopenic patient um, when they're disease-free, um, dog and cat, and you can see that I have columns for suggested levels, and these are based on on the different studies that we've done that I've over reviewed for humans and some of the information we have, limited information we have on cats and dogs. And then I look, you can look at that in relation to what AVCO recommends and what NRC is showing as well. Um, with the consensus for humans in terms of what to do with the daily protein in trying to help manage or intervene with sarcopenia, they wanted to increase it from about 0.8 to 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight, which again is a 25 to 40% increase. That translates in dogs and cats to um, a protein level from their adult maintenance from say, um, if we're looking at say AVCO from um, uh, up, to, up to like nine grams per, or 90 grams per um, thousand kcals for the dog and about 180 to 140 kcals um, of, a protein per thousand per grams of protein per thousand kcals for the cat. So that kind of looks like it's in two oh, grams me, per um, kilogram body looks weight, like it's which again in line is a 25 with, to 40 percent uh, increase. That translates in with what um, what the math kind of suggests for humans. I also just wanted to make a, a short um, couple words, if you will, on the one other aspect that's not on this on this. Um, on this chart here. We talked about these, these aspects influencing sarcopenia, but I think we also can't forget that exercise is important as well. And there are a lot of studies that indicate that sometimes exercise might be more important than nutrition, but certainly there are a lot of studies that are suggesting that um, multimodal effects or multimodal intervention of exercise and nutrition is, um, is very, very beneficial. And so um, we know that, um, uh, so that exercise I think can't be, can't be under, underscored in this. And certainly working with rehab groups um, or even just suggesting um, exercise for your older patients, older canine feline patients can be very beneficial. Um, so um, the last couple of minutes, actually I don't have a lot of time left and I just wanted to, uh, can think about another intervention that had to do with um, targeting myostatin, and we know myostatin actually is an inhibitor to mTOR, and so we don't get, we get a decrease in muscle protein synthesis versus uh, um, an increase in degradation. And, um, and this is just a couple studies that looked at um, older people in trying to supplement them with um, uh, uh, looking, looking at uh, myostatin immunoactive protein and based on their age and, um, and, that, uh, and their impact on muscle mass and function. And seeing that uh, it declined, muscle mass declined with age and that this um, uh, myostatin immun immunoreactive protein also um, increased with age. And so that's sort of um, 
a target. If we think about that, then there are a couple of, at least there's at least one product that's out there now called fortitropin. There are a number of studies that looking at fortitropin from the perspective of um, how it can help um, influence muscle, muscle accretion. And um, fortitropin is actually a, a natural proteolipid complex derived from fertilized egg yolk. And, um, and there were a number of studies that um, looked at this in humans as well as in in, um, in dogs and, um, and showed that there was benefit um, in giving fortitropin at certain dosages for um, a, a set period of time. And so uh, I'm not, not going to talk about this, and I apologize, but um, it is kind of interesting new area to consider for intervention. Um, and then future directions would be that um, I think that as indicated, I think, by, um, by Mike, uh, I'm sorry, by, by Dave earlier, is that um, we need to optimize a universal standard evaluation tool for early detection of sarcopenia and or frailty, um, and so that we can determine when we can actually be more proactive about intervention timing. I think that as our previous speaker showed us that we really should utilize the, the omics studies that um, can uh, to further um, give us evidence-based um, information on supplements that we might want to think about from a nutritional perspective or diet changes um, for dogs and cats. And um, we certainly need long, large long-term clinical trials in dogs and cat populations um, to help support these thoughts that we have instead of just extrapolating from the human information, let's actually do some um, in dogs and cats and maybe include some exercise in there as well. Um, and we need to maybe rethink what we're, what the levels of protein or in the diets for our senior patients. If you look across companies, there's a lot of difference in protein levels um, and maybe even think about leucine supplementation. And, um, <clears throat> And then make sure that we're feeding, we start young and we feed them the right diet for their life stage and maintain a healthy weight um, as, they, as they progress into old age. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for um, your attention. Let me see if we can end this. And um, I appreciate your time.